fellow colleagues, I wish to thank you for the opportunity to convey this message to Durka women's staff on the key issues of empowerment and gender equality in the workplace during this Women's Month. I'm pleased to address all of you, those working abroad as well as those in our department. Today is the last day of Women's Month 2020, which we've celebrated under the umbrella of the Global Generation Equality Campaign, with our theme, Generation Equality, Realizing Women's Rights for an Equal Future. Generation Equality has been coined, particularly by young women, as a signal that they are tired of talking equality, that this generation will achieve gender equality. In this Women's Month, we as South Africa celebrated the 64th anniversary of the Women's March to the Union Buildings in 1956 to protest against the pass laws. I wonder how many of you know what the pass laws are. Imagine this, that in 1956, each one of us as South Africans was required to carry a document that would signal your race, your gender, where you could go, what you were allowed to take on as employment, which park bench you could sit on, how much time you could spend in town. This was the life that women said we are not going to tolerate. Our mothers and grandmothers in 1956 so that Women's March heralded one of the most historic events in the struggle for freedom and women's rights in South Africa. I know many of you have heard of the term, the triple challenge borne by women under apartheid. African women, being black, were the subject of discrimination. Social engineering had led to gender inequality, so by virtue of their gender, they were disadvantaged. And there was total lack of development, particularly in our rural communities. So the status of working class and rural severely impacted upon women. And it is these women who decided they would stand up and fight for their rights. Over the course of the last 64 years, women have taken small and large steps towards advancing the rights of women. President Ramaphosa reminded us recently that our generation has inherited the noble legacy of the women of 1956. During his address on this year's Women's Day, he said, and I quote, 64 years ago, our mothers, daughters, sisters, and grandmothers stood defiant and proud, united in their demand to live in freedom. They stood not for themselves alone, but for the rights of the generations of women yet to come. Close quotes. Their generation was facing a very visible enemy and knew how to confront and dislodge it. We are facing yet again an invisible enemy in the form of the global COVID-19 pandemic. We have to confront and dislodge this enemy, which again is posing huge discriminatory loads on women as caregivers, as bedside professionals in the health sector, as those most harmed by the economic effects of COVID. So we celebrate the 2020 Women's Month in an era of what has become 
the proverbial new normal due to the impact of COVID-19. Allow me to pause for a moment and extend our heartfelt condolences to the families, friends and colleagues of our three departed dear colleagues who succumbed to this terrible pandemic. Our hearts, our thoughts, our prayers go to all those close to them. In the same breath, I wish to extend the condolences of all of us to all who have lost loved ones during this difficult time. None of us have been left untouched by this virus. We also wish to take this opportunity to wish our colleagues who are in treatment for the disease in various health facilities and those recovering at home a speedy recovery. This crisis has revealed and intensified already existing and intersecting forms of discrimination and inequalities. While it threatens the well-being and lives of all human beings, the worst impact of the disease and the responses to the disease are felt most harshly by the most vulnerable, including women and girls, who face multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. In celebration of the 64th anniversary of the 1956 Historic Women's March, our department must continue to strive hard to advance gender equality and women's empowerment through gender mainstreaming of its policies, of its programs, of its empowerment of our staff. And we need not just to think of ourselves as South Africans. We have a responsibility to the continent in its entirety. What this means then for us is that gender equality and women's empowerment is a cross-cutting matter and we'll need to ensure that we consistently integrate a gender perspective into the preparation, design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of all our policies and practices, of our regulatory measures and programs. I must say that I have been impressed by the manner in which women in DERCO really work hard at transforming the department. I know, as I've been reminded by the leadership of Nehau, that much more needs to be done. But I think advances have been made and we must celebrate that. The transformation that all of us want to see needs to take place within our broader framework of empowerment of women in our country, which is about redressing the legacy of apartheid colonialism and building a society <clears throat> based on the principles of non-racialism, non-sexism, unity, democracy and prosperity. If you look at the images of the 1956 Women's March, you would see that unity in action. You would see that non-racialism. You would see that commitment to openness and democracy. We must maintain and sustain those ideals. <clears throat> this includes ensuring that we transform gender relations between women and men, between institutions and laws. Laws which we've articulated and crafted very carefully in the Women's Charter adopted by women in South Africa in 1954 and renewed almost 50 years later in 1994 at the founding conference of the Nas Nation, uh, National Women's Coalition. 
again in the midst of this pandemic, we've seen awful scenes in our country where lockdown and staying at home has given rise to the brutal killing and maiming of women and girls, most awfully by their loved ones, by people who are supposed to honour and protect them. Of course, this domestic violence in South Africa is not new, and it painfully happens when the spotlight should be shining on the rights of women and children. Our stats essay recently released its Crimes Against Women report. And as at June 2020, femicide in our country was five times higher than the global average. We have to pause at this moment and ask ourselves why. Having witnessed the horrendous domestic violence I referred to just now, this picture of June 2020 has certainly not improved. Our cabinet has adopted this year the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, and this provides for a comprehensive response to the scourge. It's therefore absolutely imperative that we, the men and women of South Africa, address this scourge with due seriousness. We can only achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls across the globe, as is anticipated in the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, through national programs and concrete actions. We need to ensure from department to department, from office to office, from unit to unit, that we protect each other. Some commentators have said that if we do not achieve goal five of the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 Sustainable Development Goals will be meaningless, even if we achieve them. What's the use of having equal access to education if you're not safe at school? What is the use of an environment that is sustainable and cared for if women can't live within it? As we can all see, 2030 is within reach and a great deal still needs to be done. So as we mark 25 years since the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action, we have to take stock of what has been achieved and build momentum toward the realization of the 2030 Development Goals. That call that was made in Beijing in 1995, that men should be part and parcel of global efforts to promote gender equality and empower women remains relevant even today. In essence, all sectors of society, individually and collectively, have a role and a responsibility to contribute to a better world. I once served as a constituency representative of an area of the Cape Flats in Cape Town. And we had occasion with the community to discuss gender-based violence in that community. And I asked my constituency one thing. I asked them, let us keep a record as community members, not as police, not as lawyers, but as neighbours of the harm caused to our neighbours. Let us be there to protect our neighbours. And we agreed that we will try to create an award for the safest street in the constituency. It raised that idea that we shared together, the consciousness 
of each and every person to be on guard against gender-based violence. Maybe it is that level of neighborhood action that we need to bring to bear to end the scourge. You know very well, as members of our department, that as DERCO, we continue to support women's education and training through various residential programs offered by our Diplomatic Training Institute. In order to close the digital gap, we will continue enhancing women's access to digital technology. We've in fact agreed recently that every person working in DECO should be digitally competent, as we have had to learn to be during the COVID work at home period. The gender strategic framework of DERCO emphasizes systematic attention to gender equality in the department's policies and programs. The aim of the framework is to achieve gender equality in compliance with our constitution. It's to achieve equal representation and participation by women in all workplaces and to increase opportunities for employment, skills development, and upward mobility in the workplace. Our framework encourages the removal and elimination of all barriers to entry, development, and advancement for women in the department. I know we're not there as yet, but I do see that progress is being made. The Minister for Public Service and Administration launched the head of department's eight principle action plan for promoting women's empowerment and gender equality. This was launched in 2007 to ensure progress toward the successes I'm referring to in the public service. The plan was institutionalized for implementation in our public service. All government departments are expected to integrate these principles into their programs and action plans for implementation. It would be good for you to look at this implementation plan and assess in as accurate a manner as possible the level of progress we have made since 2007. We operate as colleagues in the foreign policy space and our values, which we derive from our constitution, are, I believe, the best export to the world. I always say to colleagues that I meet in other countries that if their constitution doesn't contain a clause on equality, I don't regard it as a constitution fit for the mandate we want to execute. So we have to remain true to the principles of our constitution in honor of that 1956 generation of women marchers. It is on the basis of these values that we work closely with our African brothers and sisters to develop and adopt Africa Agenda 2063 and its key aspirations. We have vowed to place women and girls at the center of our continent's development efforts. We aspire to see women who are fully empowered and have equal access and opportunity in all spheres of life in Africa. This new normal of virtual engagement will not deter us from achieving our noble goals. We stand, as I always say, on the shoulders of heroin giants. And we need to ask ourselves, given this advantage of a high reach, how will we use it? We must emulate our heroines to address our current and future challenges. I've no doubt that you, as colleagues in DERCO will strive to be among the government departments 
which lead by example in the key task of women empowerment and gender equality in the workplace. We are a department in which there are very strong power relations. And I have heard that these relations are abused by some of our colleagues. We need to put an end to these practices. We need to be extremely offended when power is abused by one gender or the other. I believe that we have the capacity to be among the best. I believe that we have the capacity to be of influence and support on the continent. So dear colleagues, as we close Women's Month, let us use that capacity. Let us put our advantages, let us put our reach to good effect and reshape our future. Thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day.